Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we are back with another installment of the Muscle Group series. In this series, we take a deep dive on specific muscles each episode. You will learn the function of the specific muscle, common training mistakes, misconceptions about that muscle group, our go-to exercises, and why we program, program them for our clients. We'll also talk about some key execution cues to nail down technique. Today's episode is covering the hamstrings, where they are, what they do, and how we train them. And just a note, I always preface this on the front end of these muscle group series, but we're not here to exhaust these the explanations of these anatomical structures as much as just kind of tell you generally where they are, where they originate and attach, and then actually go into the application of what they do most and how we train them. Okay, so take that into account when diving into this episode. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex, and he's going to dive right into the hamstrings. All right, guys. So looking at the the hamstrings, this is going to be made up of a, a group of um, specific tissue. And so within the hamstring itself, we're going to have three main components. The first one is going to be, and I'm not going to spell these out for you guys, um, do your best with the <laughs> spelling of uh, these three uh, muscles, but you're going to have the semi-tendinosis, you're going to have the semi-membranosis, and then the biceps femoris. All three of these are going to make up the hamstrings. They attach to the pelvis and the bicep femoris is going to be attached to the femur and can uh, run posteriorly down the leg. So this is going to make up the uh, posterior portion of the, the greater bit of your uh, leg itself. And then they are very important within your uh, hip extension, knee flexion, and extension um, and play an essential role within knee stability. So obviously within this large muscle group, you're going to have a lot of components that are going to play a very um, important role to a lot of the things that you are going to be doing within your leg training, as well as just day-to-day -day life. This is a very important muscle group to train, not just thinking within uh, bodybuilding or um, physique goals, but more so also going to be a very uh, important piece to your day-to-day -day functionality of uh, you know doing daily task, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and within hamstrings, it's something that, I mean, I personally love the look of hamstrings and love training hamstrings. Um, it's something that, um, if you remember from the glute episode, I'm not a fan of training glutes. If I can get around it, I really can't with Alex doing my programming, but within hamstrings, just they're very cool to see, especially if you ever watch competitors, male or female, being able to see that pop out of the back of the leg is pretty dang cool. Yeah. And <clears throat> when you're in like a, a seated position and you are like someone sees you from the side to see your hammies just hanging is a really cool feeling because it, it's just a, <laughs> at least for me, it is oh, a, a, a me cool <laughs> uh, situation to be like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm doing something well within my training. This is, this makes my leg look significantly better, especially if you don't have the hamstrings from the side, it's like, okay, now you have peg legs. Like it, <laughs> that's where you're going to, even if you have these beautiful quads from the side, it's going to look like you've got peg legs. Yeah. And some people even kind of try to not train their hamstrings as much, or I guess I would say a tail sign of someone who either genetically has really good glutes or just doesn't train hamstrings would be when your leg looks like that. So you'll see um, girls that have like really huge glutes and really small quads and hamstrings. Now, of course, that's a whole look like if we're going for the Kardashian look, um, but it is something that it can cause dysfunction. And I know we've mentioned that a lot when in regards to these muscles series, but um, of course, we love the aesthetic look of muscles. We were even just looking at some very lean competitors and seeing every muscle on their body just pulled out and it's such a cool look but muscles are more than just aesthetics they definitely do have a function to them that helps us move um, so like alex talked about as far as hip extension um, knee flexion 
knee stability, um, they're going to be very important. Um, and so going into that a little bit more, looking at that knee flexion and that hip extension. Um, so when we're looking at um, knee flexion, so an example of that is going to be something like a leg curl. Um, so this is something that is going to have some faster twitch fibers. Um, so these need a little bit more sets with lower reps and some heavier weight. Um, and it's something that uh, we like to program earlier in the workout a lot of the times. And then for hip extension, which an example of this would be like a RDL, um, is something that needs a variety of loading patterns when you are training that hip extension. Um, and it's very dependent on the integrity of your pelvis, spine, and your strength of your core. So when we're looking at training these things, it's extremely important to look at what you need to be able to train them properly or what goes into training them properly. And a lot of lower body movements really need that stability in the pelvis and need that stability in the core um, and the spine. Of course, we want to make sure our spine is in the absolute best spot, especially if we're spinal loading as we're going through any of these exercises. Um, so uh, to go into a few mistakes here. Um, well, before we do that, let's backtrack a little bit. <clears throat> where we look at the the components of, of talking about exercise selection and, and those different factors to give you guys a little bit more context as to, to why this is going to be a contributor within hip extension and uh, knee flexion as a whole. So it is going to, um, the, the hamstrings originate at the bottom of the pelvis itself. And then outside of the, the bicep femoris, which is going to originate midway down the femur and only contributes to knee flexion. So we're going to have the, it, it's going to uh, cross both joints here to allow for us to uh, need to train both in, in different fashions. So when we look at the different exercise selection, this is going to <clears throat> train the tissue in different lengths and different specificity within that. So depending on what the goal is, um, the exercise selection obviously is going to, to play a large role in that. But understanding the insertion and the origin of the tissue itself is going to be a large component in terms of understanding what joints are being acted on and those different factors. Yeah, just to kind of add on to that one, um, the, that's why that's such a, it's such a big deal within exercise selection to do movements that prioritize hip extension and also knee flexion. Right. So a lot of times, you know, we understand, and I know early on in like my programming, for example, you know, I, if I, I never really thought about it that way of like understanding the, I just understood movements, right? We kind of start out understanding what movements train, what parts of our body, which is helpful, but there is a part of that where you want to take it a step deeper and actually understanding what each, what muscles are doing and what they're doing at a joint can actually better help you choose better exercises in a multitude of exercises that best train that muscle group, right? Instead of the other way around, right? So early on, it's you kind of just start to like, I know the squat trains legs, right? And then you kind of get into, okay, what joints does it train? Okay. What muscles go around that joint and are trained by that movement pattern, right? And so we get a little deeper, get a little deeper. And that's where we really started to expand our knowledge and got better and better at program design. And such a big thing with the hamstrings is that they do cross multiple joints, right? All three heads do cross or, or attach at the hip. Um, that short head of the biceps femoris. So there's two heads. There's a long head and a short head, just like your biceps brachii, just like your arm muscles. So you can think of the hamstrings sort of like the biceps of your lower body um, in the way that they pretty much function. And so with that in mind, we need to prioritize both functions, right? We need to prioritize a hip extension function. We also need to prioritize a knee flexion component. And later in this episode, we're actually going to get into um, some ways that we program that for clients and be sure that we get both into the programming because it doesn't always all have to come on one day, right? Or even one training block if we don't want it to, um, although I would recommend it. But we'll kind of talk about organization and stuff like that. So I just wanted to add that in before we moved on there. 
Yeah. So let's go ahead and go over, instead of going straight into the training mistakes, I'll go into the exercises that train um, hip extension and then that also train knee flexion, just so you have that kind of bulleted down in your head of, oh, this is what's training hip extension and this is what's training knee flexion. And something that we also say in this muscle group series is that you cannot fully isolate one muscle. They do not work in isolation. Um, So when I talk about these different exercises, it's not saying you're only training your hamstrings by doing these exercises. Um, And some of these, your hamstrings are more of a stabilizer and some of them, they're the main mover. They have secondary muscles that are moving and other stabilizers helping them. So just keep that in mind as we talk through exercises. It's not just this is only training hamstrings and you're getting nothing else from it. Um, It's just going to be what's biasing hamstrings as we go through it. Um, So some things that train it as a hip extensor are going to be hip extension um, when it comes to like a 45 degree hip extension, but um, that's something that is going to be more of um, the hamstrings are going to shorten in that. um, And it's also going to be something like an RDL. Um, So a stiff leg RDL or a bent knee RDL. And then some more compound movements that have that hip extension are going to be the squat, deadlift, leg press, lunges. Um, And hamstrings perform more of an isometric and stability role in those exercises, those compound exercises, um, as far as that squat, deadlift, leg press, and lunge. Um, So there's multiple exercises that do train that in hip extension. And then when it comes to knee flexion, we're mostly looking at leg curls here. So see seated or um, lying leg curls. Yes. And so to, to add on to the knee flexion option, so there's, there's really only two, some gyms are going to have the luxury of a standing option, which is going to be very similar from a a mechanical perspective of the uh, lying option, because you're going to be in a slight degree of hip flexion as, as you are kind of pitched back, if you will. Um, and then you're going to have the ability to go into, um, a, a full knee flexion under, uh, the load itself. So those are gonna be your three options from a knee flexion perspective. The, the seated hamstring is going to be, or the seated hamstring curl is going to train the hamstrings into the mid range. Um, you'll find that you are significantly, not significantly, but a, a good bit stronger with the seated uh, hamstring curl comparatively to the lying because of your, just kind of how you're set up and where the positioning is going to be training through the mid range comparatively to the lying being a, a shortened emphasis where the pelvis is having to be stabilized by yourself. Whereas within the seated hamstring curl, you're going to have the pad and, and you're really going to have a, a perfect setup for you to be very, very stable without having to do a whole lot of stabilization yourself. Um, so there's going to be variance in terms of strength there, not to say that one is better than the other, just understanding the mechanics of the two to utilize both within your, your training specifically. And if you have the seated leg curl that doesn't have the pad that goes down like on your quads, then that's going to be a little bit wonky as far as stabilization. So you might be like, well, I don't have as much stabilization in this exercise, but it is going to be dependent on the machine. Now, just like every other muscle group series, we are going to have a playlist linked in this going over the exercises. And we have some great videos going over the seated and the lying leg curl, as well as how to spot on the lying leg curl, talking about the setup, because the setup is going to be a main driver if you are actually hitting the muscle um, in the way that you want to. Um, So within knee flexion, it's something that you also want to make sure that, um, especially when training heavy or using dorsiflexion, um, to make sure that the calves can contribute some, um, because this is going to provide more knee stability. Um, Now, when we're talking about your calves and hamstrings, um, it's something that we do kind of want to talk about together um, to a certain degree, because the calves are big stabilizers when it comes to the hamstrings. And when you're doing something like a lying leg curl, that first 15 degrees of that movement is mainly working your calves. So you can even use that as a calf exercise and just do the 15 degree lying leg curl. Um, But it's something that if you use too much um, acceleration or you're too fast out of that bottom of the lying leg curl, it can really be that the calves take over the whole entire movement and you're not getting the best bang for your buck for your hamstrings out of that movement. So the calves are an important stability 
stabilizer, but we don't want to overuse them so that we're not getting our hamstrings in place. But this is also something where I used to do calves at the beginning of a workout so that I wouldn't just leave at the end of a workout and not do calves because I used to do that. Uh, But it was something that because I was exhausting my calves early in the workout, um, I didn't have them as stabilizers and movements like the lying leg curl or in a squat or whatever else I might be doing. So within the the hip extension options, Austin, do you want to kind of, um, you know, talk about the, um, your your favorites within that and, and just the the value that they carry within your your training programming yeah in terms of hip extension my favorite uh by far is the the rdl um that's i just think that's one of the coolest uh like grip and rip sort of exercises that uh it takes a lot of stabilization um it takes a lot of of core strength it takes a lot of strength within your your low back your spinal erectors um, which do stabilize the spine and the pelvis. Um, and also within the RDL and other hip extension exercises, right? We are getting components of the adductors in there, right? Through the adductor magnus, which actually functions more like a hip extensor than anything. Um, and then also that glute max, which is going to play a large role uh, with the glute mean and glute minimus, you know, playing a very small role in, in helping stabilize the the hip Um, so it's a, you know, great if we're using the terminology sort of like bang for your buck exercise or hip extension variation, huge fan of the RDL. And when looking at, I just wanted to kind of touch on this because I had it in my notes when you guys think about, um, you know, hip extension exercises specifically, right. Um, maybe in a later episode, we'll kind of go into, uh, where those differ a little bit more, but within like an RDL and the difference between an RDL and like a squat, for example, is obviously the squat does have components of hip extension, hip flexion, all of that stuff. Um, but in terms of like the simultaneous usage or uh, technique that is needed through something like an RDL versus a, a back squat, right? The component of hip flexion, hip extension, knee flexion, knee extension, like all that stuff happening at once, right? These are all things that are adding more muscle groups together and changing the roles of those muscle groups throughout the movement, right? So when looking at lower body movements, especially hip extension, hip extension focused ones, we are still, as I said, using the glutes, we're still using the adductors in a large way, um, especially that adductor magnus, which, you know, if you guys watch, I think Julian Smith's like the most fun person to do or watch do like an art watch to do an RDL. I'm not saying that right. <laughs> Julian Smith's the best person to watch do an RDL. Doing an RDL? <laughs> I think that's it. Doing an RDL. Anyways, so when you get to the bottom, uh, when he gets to the bottom of the RDL, right, you kind of, and I think this just obviously we all do this and you can see this on most people with adductors and hamstrings, but as you get to the very, very bottom, right, you can start to see those adductors almost like, quote unquote, like pop out, right? We can kind of see that happen. And obviously that has to do with sort of the the passing of the torch or the passing of the baton of responsibilities, right? With certain degrees of hip flexion and, and hip extension. Um, and that's sort of like the different roles, right? We talk about that with the calves and lying leg curls and, and sort of passing the baton to the uh, hamstrings and like a lying leg curl, for example. So like we start out with a straight knee, we start out kind of using the calves a bit more. They pass off the baton to the hamstrings as they go. And the same kind of goes with things like the hip extension based exercises with the responsibilities throughout the, the glutes, the adductors, the hamstrings, and then the roles of the calf, for example, of helping stabilize the knee, um, within movements like that. And so why I bring all that up, hopefully I didn't confuse you too much, but why I brought all that up is because a movement just like the RDL, we can think about it in a way where, okay, it just trains my hamstrings. And that couldn't be furthest from the truth, right? It absolutely does train your hamstrings, but it's also training glute max. It's training the, the other glute uh, muscles that we talked about in the previous episode of this muscle group series and the medius and minimus it's also you know training those adductors it's training those calves and their stability roles it's training that core those spinal erectors right it's it's there's so much co-contraction and and sort of synchronicity that's happening throughout the body to coordinate that very complex movement that 
I just think is very cool, but also it translates really well into that core stability. It translates really well into other movements, you know, like other deadlift variations, like other um, squat variations, um, and then translates really well as into other unilateral variations, right? Lunge variations, split squat variations. So um, that's in, in terms of, I can touch on more there, but that in terms of like hip extension exercises, the RDL is my absolute favorite there. And there is so much involved within that movement that we are training. And so understanding that it is sort of one of those quote unquote bang for your buck exercises that is so valuable. Um, and I don't know if you, we want to go into uh, the kind of, we probably won't want to, but there is a YouTube video uh, that you can watch that talks about kind of the straight leg deadlift and the RDL and how those differ a little bit more than each other and, and what biases which one a little bit more. One biases the hamstrings, one biases the glutes a bit more. So spoiler alert there. Um, but I won't tell you which one, maybe. Uh, but that's that's as far as my favorites go. And within um, hip extension, it's something that I hear from clients and just from anyone that that's where a lot of people feel lower back pain the most. Um, So I wanted to be able to dig into that just a little bit because I know that's something that's very, very common. And a lot of people will shy away from certain um, hip extension exercises because they're just like constantly feeling it in their lower back. Um, So Alex, what would you say is the reason they're always feeling it in their lower back? For the listeners, do you guys feel like it is humorous how Sue poses questions for me at t- from times? Like she, <laughs> she's just like <laughs> it's like the same tone. I think it, I think it's just funny each time she does it. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's go ahead uh, and look at that specifically, where individuals who are are struggling with um, wanting to really excel within the RDL or in these hip extension movements specifically, um, oftentimes are going to be relying far too much on their erectors to do a lot of the the lifting. They're not allowing for their hips to really shift back within those movements specifically. So with us talking about the insertion and the origin of that tissue and, and the hip extension movements, the, the RDL, the stiff knee RDL, um, deadlift, what have you, we're wanting to get those two points as far away from one another as possible. So if we are not driving those hips back and we're just kind of moving in this vertical plane, that is going to one, not not put us in a position to really train the hamstrings as a whole. Of course, we're going to be feeling sensation to that tissue, but for us to have true focus and, and allocating a lot of that tension on the hamstrings, we're going to really need to drive those hips back as far as we can. And that's going to uh, rely a lot on the individual's um, mobility within the um the hips specifically. So some individuals who have greater mobility are going to be able to drive their hips back further. Someone like myself who has very poor mobility is probably not going to be able to drive my hips back as far as what Sue can. Sue is is very limber in nature, thus she can drive her hips back a little bit further. So it's going to look different from person to person, but the main component is being able to drive those hips back as far as you can while maintaining tension, maintaining a neutral spine, those different factors, bracing your core, and and being able to initiate more horizontally than thinking more vertical within a lot of these movements. And if you are listening to that and you're like, okay, I do that when I'm going through it, I really wanted to go over spine movement and head positioning as well and range of motion because um, if you are still doing what Alex just said, you could possibly still have lower back pain if you're not taking into account your range of motion, your head positioning, um, and being able to really look at how much your core is braced. It's extremely important in these exercises to have a strong core and to really work on that. I know everyone hates training abs. I'm right there with you, but it is so, so important, not just for getting abs, but again, for the function of your body and what having a strong core means to make sure that we don't throw out our back or have this extreme lower back pain. Now you might also be sitting at a desk all day. And if you sit all day long, you can have a very weak low back. And so even if your form is perfect, let's have that scenario where someone's form is perfect, but they're still having lower back pain. It can be from your lower back being too weak from you sitting all day and not moving throughout the day and then still keeping that core tight. So side note on that, but as far 
as that range of motion, like Alex was saying, as far as that hip movement back and forward, instead of just thinking about going up and down, let's go ahead and use the RDL for an example, since we're already talking about it. If you're in an RDL and you are um, thinking about just lifting the weight up. That's where, again, some of that pain can come from. You want to kind of think that your hands are hooks and you're just thinking about that hip movement. So pushing those hips back and bringing them back um, into a neutral position. Um, So as you go through that, as soon as your hips stop moving backwards, that's your end range of motion. A lot of times you'll see, and even if you record yourself, which I highly recommend recording yourself instead of trying to watch yourself in the mirror, and I'll talk about that in a second as I go into head positioning, Um, but it's something that um, if you go if your hips stop moving back, normally what you see in videos is then just people's upper body moves down. Now you might get more sensation. You might be like, I feel more of a stretch in my hamstrings, but there's an extremely big difference between sensation and tension. And I can tell you, you're really just pulling at the joints instead of actually getting more tension throughout that muscle. Um, So it's something that I highly recommend you to video yourself. As soon as your hips stop moving backwards, that's your end range of motion. Even if the dumbbells aren't at your toes, they do not need to reach the ground. Some people, they still might. Again, if you have super great mobility in your hips and you have the right limb lengths, um, you might be able to reach your toes and still be in correct positioning. But depending on your limb lengths and your hip mobility, you might not reach your toes. For me, it's right under my knee that that's that end range of motion for me um, for that RDL. Now getting into why you need to film yourself instead of watching yourself, if you have any kind of extension or flexion at any point in the spine, there's normally extension or flexion in another part of your spine. So if you're doing an RDL and looking up at yourself in the mirror or just looking up in general, so I see it time and time again, of RDL is great form and then someone's head is cricked up um, and they're either looking up at the sky or just looking up in front of them, that extension at the spine at your neck is going to cause it in your lower back and going to cause lower back pain. Um, So it's something that you want to maintain that neutral spine all the way through, not just all the way up to your neck. It's still um, something that in your neck, you still have to make sure that you have that um, neutrality throughout your whole spine. So if you have that neutral spine and if you have a strong core and you focus on that hip movement, then that is going to sidestep a lot of that lower back pain, um, especially as you continue to strengthen your lower back by going through these exercises. So if you're more of a beginner, you might still have some pain again if the execution is there, um, but it is something that you just need to strengthen those muscles as a whole um, as you go through it. So uh, really, really, really encourage you to film yourself if you're having a lot of lower back pain and either sending it to your coach or kind of taking these tips and watching our videos that will be linked in the show notes to really make sure you're getting everything out of these exercises and getting out of any kind of injury because those aren't fun at all. Yeah. And if to expand on Sue's point here, if you are someone who does work your way up in load, um, the neutral spine is quite relative to the individual. So it doesn't have to be like stiff as a board, never moves. Um, it's more or less the, the relative understanding of creating, as she said, neutrality, um, and trying to maintain a position. But again, the more the load you have on the bar, the more that spine is going to potentially, you know, flex a little bit or, or move a little bit. And that's very normal, right? That's not something we should shy away from. And that's definitely not something as long as you feel stable and you're s- staying away from injury, you c- maintain core stability, all of that stuff. It's not something you should shy away from adding load, for example, just because your spine kind of starts to move, right? It's sort of the similar thing, like within the lying leg curl, if your butt moves just a little bit because you're moving a lot of load and creating a lot of tension, that doesn't make that exercise wrong, right? It's just, there's a lot of tension going through different joints. And if you're using hundreds of pounds on an RDL, you could imagine the forces and the torque and the, all of the stuff and the tension that's going through different joints. And it's one of those things where joints have to react. They have to stabilize themselves. They have to protect themselves. And so it's up to us to 
sort of coordinate as much as we can consciously while the body subconsciously coordinates the rest to stabilize our core, our spine, our pelvis, all of those things. And that comes down in a large way to our conscious intent and a technique, which is what we go into more and more within our YouTube content. So if you guys are interested in that um, beyond this podcast, then I do recommend um, the YouTube channel because it's a good one. And now I will pose another question to Alex and use a different tone <laughs> so that I don't get roasted again. Alex, how have you been approaching hamstring training with NPD clients, especially competitors? <laughs> You're ridiculous. Okay. Um, within, within hamstring training, this is uh, kind of a, approaching it differently within each division, of course. So when we're looking at divisions such as wellness or figure, um, we may have a little bit of a, a different breakdown or utilization within programming. Uh, a, a greater portion of our clientele is going to be based in, bikini in, in the bikini division. Thus, um, within that, this is going to, uh, within the program design, is going to more often than not be placed with like a full lower session is, is generally how I've been utilizing it because we have generally a limited uh, quantity of quad volume that we are allocating. So I can generally kind of fit that into a full lower body session. Whereas when I'm utilizing it within our figure or wellness uh, competitors where we have a greater density of, of quad volume being allocated, then at that point, I may have to break things down into like an anterior posterior session. But for a majority of our clients being in the bikini division, it's easier just to make full lower body sessions. So uh, utilizing a lot of the exercises that we have uh, spoke on today uh, in different facets and, and those things, but uh, hamstrings are going to be a large portion of our, our program design within the uh, athletes as a whole, because it is such a, um, I mean, a, a main muscle group that's going to be judged on stage specifically with all the, all three of those divisions. And with that, what I would say is that um, we've talked about it before and we can possibly even do a whole nother episode on this as far as when you should reach out to a coach if you're wanting to prep or compete and what that looks like. Of course, more time with a coach is always going to be better, but it's something that a girl came to me a few girls came to me um, about six months ago saying that they wanted to compete. And it was very evident within their pictures that they needed more time and they needed more muscle. And so it was something where I was like, we're going to nail down variables, then we're going to go into a cut to truly see where your muscle is at. So we can get rid of some of that fat and see where the muscle is at and what we truly need to work on. And then being able to build again from there before we go into a prep. And the reason I mentioned that is if you are a competitor um, or wanting to compete, it can be very helpful to get lean before you prep to see where your base of muscle truly is, as well as to allow your coach to go through a deficit with you that's not a prep. So they really get a good feel of your body and how it works, not an actual feel of your body, um, but like to get a view of how the muscle is laid out on your physique. Because if you have a body fat covering muscle, sometimes it can be difficult to truly see what amount of muscle tissue you have. And so it's something um, that for some something like hamstrings and your quads and glutes, females do store a lot of body fat on their lower body. So it can be very helpful to get leaner um, or within 10 pounds of what a stage weight would be to truly see where things are at and where you need to work on. Because um, I've been there personally. And then I know that Alex has also had clients go through this where they diet and then they just realize they don't have as much muscle as they originally thought. So it's something worth noting, um, especially with those lower body um, muscles and being able to see where you need to work on things. Yeah. And, and for female competitors specifically, um, where you are potentially or, or a greater majority of you are going to be holding um, the majority of your body fat in your lower limbs uh, and, and hips specifically, that allows for us to really see how much glute tissue, how much hamstring tissue is, is truly there. Um, and from an exercise selection perspective, I don't, every like top tier athlete that we have is really, really good at RDLs. Like the 
in terms of having a, a incredible glute and, and hamstring development, um, I, I couldn't, there's not a single girl that I can, that comes to mind that is not extremely, extremely good and strong within that movement specifically that has some of the best glutes and hamstrings on the team. You can just say my name, Alex. <laughs> it's actually not me who has the best glutes or hamstrings, but I'll let myself keep believing that. Um, so Austin, I'll ask you in the way that I apparently always ask questions. Uh, <laughs> what sort of reps and sets do you use most with hamstrings? And does it depend on exercise? Yeah, I think it does depend on the exercise. And Obviously, it's going to depend on programming. It's going to depend on the goal of that programming and, and kind of what your periodization is currently and, and what you're either yourself, the program you're following or the coach that you have is sort of currently shooting or aiming for. Um, but within exercise selection, I think it matters. And I would say the more compound oriented ones like the RDL or, or the straight leg deadlift or something like that, I think you should probably steer clear of super high reps, um, just from the standpoint of, uh, risk of injury, but also just sort of quality over quantity here, right? Because we have other tools at our disposal, um, because we are training the hip extension function extremely well through a lower rep range, there really isn't a need to do what we can do with a, a seated or lying leg curl variation with higher reps that we should try and do with a hip extension exercise. And I say that because, you know, as we talked about lower back injuries, as we talked about um, core strength and stability, there are so many vulnerabilities that can happen or can progress with using compound based exercises like an RDL, like we've been talking about today, right? So I think within an RDL, you know, if your goal is to, to basically improve your physique, which, or to develop, develop your physique here is what we, I guess we talk about on the physique development mm -hmm. podcast, but, um, you know, I, I'd probably stick within, you know, a, a four to eight rep range using the RDL, you, you know, you can work your way up to 10. Um, but I usually don't go above 10, uh, personally, and I don't usually recommend that or would program that for clients because we can do the other we can train the hamstrings through knee flexion um, with higher reps if we want to go for that adaptation or if we want to kind of drive a stimulus or a stress forward in the hamstrings we can utilize that um, in lying leg curl variation so as i was saying like or just to kind of specifically answer the question for everyone you know somewhere between the four to ten rep range with compound movements within for the RDL, obviously, as you get closer to four, that load starts to go up. The percentage of one rep max starts to go up. And then the closer you get to 10, right, it probably starts to go down. And then, well, it's going to force itself down if you don't. Um, and then, you know, with the lying leg curl and seated leg curl and, and even the unilateral standing leg curl variation, you know, you can go lower rep. And I would recommend training knee flexion at lower rep ranges at higher intensities as well but you can start to work up that rep range. And I would say if I had to choose a movement to do higher reps with, I would personally choose the seated leg curl variation because your pelvis is stabilized artificially by not only internally, but also externally by the machine itself, right? You're seated on the machine, which is going to naturally stabilize your pelvis for you in a large way. And then you're internally stabilizing things as well. So, um, it's a great environment to do a lot of work. And we talk a lot about within our content, creating environments to do hard, challenging work, right. And, and to steer clear of injury and to maximize a training stimulus or a training stress. So, um, if I were to choose a movement to do higher rep ranges with, I would probably choose if I had, you know, <laughs> gun to my head, whoever's pointing these guns, um, I would choose uh, seated leg curl. And I guess the next best thing I would say is probably the lying for higher rep ranges. Um, but again, there's so many things down the line that you can, we can start to implement and, and pair together. Um, and then you can also pair together different supersets, right? Um, and that's going to depend on challenging. And you can pair together lower rep ranges into supersets. You can pair together higher rep into supersets, right? I think one thing that I see a lot, and I know we all see it with incoming clients, is kind of looking at people's programs that they've been doing, 
and there's, or just seeing programs out there, there's sort of this misconception around the fact that supersets kind of quote unquote have to be higher rep range. Not necessarily the case. You can absolutely pair things together that are in a lower rep range at a higher intensity with even more rest periods in between them. And the hamstrings are a great muscle group to do that. Um, you know, supersets of, of four to six, right? We've all done that. And it is a great way to create a large stimulus, a lot of tension at a high intensity within the hamstrings, especially, especially within those hip extension exercises, but also the knee flexion ones. Yeah. And the last thing that I'll touch on, unless anyone has something else, um, is to location in your training um, as far as doing some of these exercises. So anything that is going to be more of a compound movement, um, including something like an RDL, but also looking at those squats and deadlifts, is making sure that it's earlier in your workout. The reason for this is because of everything that we've touched on, you have to create more stabilization and there's more muscle groups involved. Involved. And if you go through the exercise and try to do something really heavy or really complex at the end of a workout, you have exhausted different stabilizers, you've exhausted different muscle groups, and that can leave you very prone to injury or lead you to not working the muscles you want to. So if you have completely thrashed your adductors um, and then try to go into um, an RDL, you're going to, your body is going to use other muscles to be able to compensate. And that can be painful or just neglecting the point of the exercise. So um, I know we get questions as far as, oh, should I follow the order of the exercise? Or what if a piece of machinery or something is taken? Um, and it's always going to be best to do it in the order that it's programmed, because I know at least for physique development, there is a reason for the order. It's not just haphazard. Um, I can't say the same for every other program I've looked at, but I will say that for PD programming. Um, and so it is something that the best that you can do things in a certain order, um, especially if you have to exchange something, being smart and not exchanging a very complex complex and compound movement for something that is going to be very stabilized and then trying to go um, and move around from that um, because that can be where a lot of injuries take place or not getting the muscle group um, that you're trying to hit. Anything else to wrap it up? Don't think so. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for tagging along for another episode of the muscle group series. I believe we have one or two left to finish up. So we'll be wrapping that up. Um, and then just back to the normal episodes that we've been doing. So if you have any suggestions for episodes or any questions for Q and a episodes, there is, um, a, form below that you can go ahead and submit that in as well as any feedback that you have on the podcast. And then as always in the show notes is going to be a playlist going over the exercises that we've talked about. And I highly encourage you guys to go and watch those videos because they are going to be very helpful to visually see what we're talking about um, and to get a play by play basically on the execution um, and the setup of those uh, exercises. So we'll catch you on the next one. See ya.